Welcome to the EPG Patshala and my name is Asha Kuthari Chaudhary and I am professor in English at Guwahati University. We are doing a course in Indian writing in English and the module we are going to look at now is on home, identity and space. We are going to be considering the poetry of a few post-colonial Indian writers who are in so many ways exploring these themes of home, of identity and of location. And we are going to try and see in a structured manner how the work of people like Keki Daruwala, people like uh, Adil Jassawala, Nisim Ezekiel, Imtiaz Dharkar and a few more poets tends to look at ideas of history, ideas of identity, of self-formation, of uh, the, the idea of simply how do you voice yourself and that becomes a very important uh, vision in so many of these uh, uh, po uh, poets works. Also where do you speak from? Where does your poetic voice arise from? Where does it emanate from? Which means what we are looking at is the idea of space. So you have in India a vastly different varied uh, geographical terrain and voices that come from different parts of the country are almost always um, carrying with themselves baggage from their own home territories. And the twang of that particular geography tends to come into the poetic voices uh, either through linguistic formations, through syntax or through, through the content that they might have. So space becomes a very, very important factor in the landscaping of uh, Indian poetry that has come out uh, in the contemporary times. Space also in some sense denotes home and abroad. So ideas of home, where you find your identity, how do you articulate yourself within this community is another big factor in terms of uh, the content and the tropes that sort of bind these uh, poems that we are going to look at together. Uh, it also uh, addresses the idea of homelessness, the other, the flip side of what it me means to have a home or what it means to not really fit in or to belong. So we come to the corollary idea of migration and diasporic poetry. So these are all uh, very interesting nuances that you will find in poetry uh, of the post-colonial Indian uh, uh, writing in English. Let us look then at the work of Keki and Daruwala. We have already considered him in one of the previous modules but in this module we are going to be tracking notions of identity of home and location or space. When we look at the work of Daruwala we understand that he believes in what we understand to be a subjective response of the poet in producing a work of art and he says that poetry for him is first personal, exploratory, at times even therapeutic which helps in coming to terms with one's interior world or landscape. In terms of migrations, uh, you have Daruwala reflecting on the idea of displacement that has evolved a new terrain of thought in ascribing identity uh, to a group of people who are categorized as migrants. The poem is drafted in a inductive kind of a mode and Dharuwala oscillates between two polarities, the public and the private. The speaker estimates a survey of the factors of forced migration, droughts, plagues and even the infamous year 1947 that saw the partition of India. 
The difficulty in retracing the past indicates that the speaker is not just dealing with spatial displacement as the only condition of migration, but is equally uh, broadening the limits of a conceptual migration. In the work of Jointa Mahapatra, who is an Odia poet born in Katak in Odisha in 1928, originally um, an academic, he is a professor of physics at Ravenshaw College. Mahapatra started writing poetry when he was about 40. That's a late age to begin writing poetry. And then you have the stoic acceptance of pain and suffering in the life of Urissa as a part of a kind of cosmic agenda which is a central concern in his poetry. So you will find that the landscape is very, very interesting. It's this interior landscape that will flow out into the, the ex exterior terrain. The early obscurity and ambiguity in his poems arise from the bold juxtaposition of the abstract and the concrete words and in the syntactic experiments mostly disjunctions. You will find that the surreal world permeates his poetry along with conceits and imagery and therefore the psychology or the inner world of the felt world that is lived is equally important. So that is why when we speak of Jointa Mahapatra, we are constantly referring to two kinds of landscapes, the inner landscape and the outer landscape that somehow seem to coalesce. He has earned uh, the honor to be actually the first Indian English poet to receive the Sahitya Academy Award for his poem um, called uh, Relationship, which came in 1981 which was an epic poem in 12 sections that um, is set in Orissa's mythology and among its monuments. The poem, The Exile, is a brilliant espousal of the discourse of an in-between space or what we sometimes refer to as a liminal space. Mahapatra's prime concern is to validate the propositional base of sharing a space that is both liminal and claustrophobic. We find that the urgency of maintaining one's cultural roots is what Mohapatra seeks to uphold and the deep-seated sense of nostalgia seems to pervade this poem. The title is in some sense self-explanatory. But it justifies the polemics that centers around the cultural embeddedness of an exile, authenticated either by a deliberate choice or a condition levied by an, any coercive authority. The poem begins with a speaker revisiting his space, uh, his place of origin, which is characterized by debris, suggested from the expression moldy village. The speaker adroitly fuses the personal with the impersonal in order to intensify the remoteness of his positions. Corpses smolder past his nights is an unfailing testimony to the nightmares which seem to strangle his English-speaking Western identity. The past becomes a fascinating obsession for the speaker. The reference to the goddess Kali immediately conveys the emotional and mental discomfiture of the speaker. The poem concludes with the speaker's conviction that his son too would have to face an identity threat such as this. When we look at the work of Nisim Ezekiel, who in so many ways is the, is the most intrepid of the Indian uh, writers writing verse or poetry in independent India. Nisim Ezekiel is born in Mumbai, then referred to as Bombay, in a Bene Israeli family in 1924. He was educated at Wilson College uh, at Bombay and then goes on to England to study philosophy. Several volumes of poetry, chief among which are A Time to Change, which came, which came in 1952, and the last one that comes with 
Edinburgh interlude lightly uh, in 1983 and the collected poems that come in 1989. Ezekiel's uniqueness lies in his attempt to free the Indian English literature from the unconditional influence of the British Romanticism and Victorianism. He has a very precise use of the English language and its improvisational standardization. The novel use of Babu English, well-crafted imagery and the thematic preoccupation with human sexuality, alienation, identity and the modernist conception of existence have undoubtedly earned him a, a permanent place in this particular firmament that we are looking at. In the poem called Island, Ezekiel microcosmically mirrors the island city in exploring the intricacies of identity politics. The poem is couched in the form of a snide rebuttal of the very condition of being an outsider. Ezekiel's own version of the discourse of hybridity becomes evident from his Bene Israeli background. Ezekiel also portrays the city of Mumbai or Bombay as it, he refers to it, uh, to be the refuge of all migrant communities in India. There is a deliberate injunction of a Jewish identity into the mores and mannerisms of an alien country, as well the island city of Bombay, irrespective of the cultural, socio-political and religious differences that reveal the neutrality of the city in a, in, a, in a place of equality to the migrants. The speaker then analyzes the counter effects of his own voice, which is both poetic and Jewish, and states his inability to comprehend the ambiguity ingrained within it. The expression distorted echoes thus projects the modernist angst the paranoia of the modern man in unearthing the manifold significances and therefore ambiguity of his existence. Like Baudelaire's Paris or Eliot's London, Ezekiel's Bombay has archetypal modern experiences. Bombay becomes the epitome of India in all her minutiae. Bombay is his home as it is home to millions of homeless people. Minority poem is a poem where Ezekiel maps a coming to terms of an individual with the strangeness of an alien country. The minority question permeates the entire text of the poem ranging from differences in belief systems to mythological, historical, racial and political differences. The speaker's conjuring of an esoteric picture of some invisible guests who are just come in to join the speaker in a leisurely fashion. The theme or subject of discussion is rather unknown. The poet fails to comprehend the logical specificity of their religious views. The minority question burgeons when the speaker realizes that it is the language that serves to be the chief agent of difference. The language factor, therefore, seems to be the crux of the minority question, as it not only dislocates the speaker, but also deprives them of the privilege of being insiders. Our next poet is Imtiaz Dharkar. We have referred to her work in another previous module. She was born in 1954 in Lahore. And considers herself to be a Scottish Calvinist Muslim. Her poetry is something that tries to convince one of the assurance or tries to assure one of the fact that irrespective of geographical differences, the female condition remains a common, universal. We have already spoken uh, to you in a previous module about her poem Parda 1. In this module we are looking at Parda 2. Parda 2 is a kaleidoscopic 
kind of depiction of the condition of a wheeled Muslim woman. The poem is also a bold scrutiny of the lot of women who are Muslims, fraught with the jaded fundamentalist discourse of the traditional wheel that goes on to describe an identity that is always suppressed and that negates all possibilities of emancipation or self-expression. The poem, in some sense, could be referred to as being quite dialogical. Uh, you find a polyphony of voices that clamor together for the liberation of one essential identity, a Muslim parda clad female. The enveloping sense of alienation becomes more poignant in the case of the speaker as she is fraught within the clutches of cultural alienation, spatial dislocation, linguistic difference and identity politics. The poem must be seen as a complex negotiation, cultural, social, psychological, physiological, political, all of these that are conceived to assert a distinctive space for the gendered female identity. In the second stanza, we come across a bold assertion uh, where Dharkar sets out to criticize the traditional Muslim elementary education as shallow or baseless. She juxtaposes the sacred with the profane in giving the image of the teenage haji. And the sexual imagery of the quote is, your breast still tiny grew an inch, unquote, is a reminder of the growth in the girl as well as to convey the idea of readiness of the female body to understand and experience the sexual urge. The, express the expression unwilling virgins which equates the female condition to a sacrificial lamb pinpoints of psychological impact of such repression in the girls. Meta-narratives of religion and sexuality are fused with the politics of asserting a microscopic individuality. The all-persuasive sense of claustrophobia is highlighted in the woman's dilemma when they begin to conceive of God uh, as replicating the symbol of patriarchal authority. Coming to the work of Agha Shahid Ali, who was born in Kashmir in 1949, we come to one of the most loved voices in English poetry and also one of the diasporic ones. Among his very well-known works are uh, Bone Sculptor, which came in 1972 in memory of Begum Makhtar and other poems, The Half-Inch Himalayas, A Walk Through the Yellow Pages and so on. In Snowman, Agha Shahid Ali defines or redefines rather the politics of identity formation by enumerating the lineage of a checkered history of a particular section of people. The speaker does not feel the uncanny pull of his roots when he hears the generations of his ancestors tapping his window. The metaphorical association of tapping at the window is meant to suggest an invisible cord of oneness. In this module, what we were doing was that we were tracking the ideas of identity, of home and of space through the works of a number of Indian post-colonial writers or poets who are writing in English. Uh, among them, we have considered the work of Keki Daruwala, of Nisim Azikil, of Imtiaz Dharkar, of Agha Shahid Ali, among others. What has emerged from this discussion? How does this voice of the Indian writer who writes in English emerge? And how does it turn into poetry? And because we are considering issues of home, identity and space, what are the factors that uh, actually fuses personal history with the impersonal and to what effect? 
What are the questions that we need to ask to understand better, to render some kind of clarity in our reading of these specific themes for uh, the Indian poets who are working in these particular uh, spheres and have to necessarily refer to these three ideas uh, in their articulation of their selfhood and in fact to give voice to their poetic selves. Why do you think uh, that the speaker is concentratedly urban? That becomes also a very interesting kind of a question and because we have referred to space that is one of the central questions that one also will need to uh, look into. How does the urban space affect uh, all these people in terms of inner or exterior landscape of their verse? What are the cultural prescriptions responsible for the limitation of freedom in case of the female voice? We have spoken of Imtiaz Dharkar. What do you think that the poem uh, or the poet's voices uh, depict in terms of gender? How does gender work through these other three themes? So these are little nuances that we would all have to concentrate upon and having looked at many of these poems in detail, we hope we will be able to work out some of the answers to some of these questions. Thank you.